Shabbat Shalom and Hat Sameach. Here we are, the holy day, Shavuot 220. And I have a message today. Uh, it says we need to give meat in two season. And this is dealing with the whole subject of Shavuot, which is the harvest. And it's called, Are You Preparing Your Fallow Ground? Are you preparing your fallow ground? Of course, fallow means uh, unplowed, hard, hardened ground, unprepared. Are you preparing your fallow ground? It shall vault, right? So what does that mean? It means it's harvest time. We know that the harvest starts at uh, Aviv, the beginning of the month, and then we have Pesach, the 14th day, and then you have to have the wave sheaf for the Feast of First Fruit, which is the first day of the week during unleavened bread, the day of the Sabbath during unleavened bread. And then you count seven full Sabbaths. So we've been doing that, showing the complete cycle, like I said, of a believer. And here we are, now it's harvest time, right? The harvest has already come in. It's the end of the grain harvest. So my first question is, how much fruit did you harvest this year? Because remember, we're rewarded for the fruit that we're bearing. How much fruit did you harvest this year? When you're planting, the first thing you have to do is you have to break or plow your fallow ground. Because you have to prepare your field for seeding, your spiritual field for seeding. And I think this is the reason why so many brethren, or at least some brethren, are not bearing fruit. Because if you simply throw seed and you don't prepare, you don't prepare the fallow ground, Nothing will happen. The seed will stay there. The birds will eat it up. The rain will wash it away. So you have to plow or you have to prepare. You have to break the hard fallow ground. Uh, there will be no death to take root if you don't do this. So if you really believe that Yahweh's latter rain is here, then you have to prepare your fallow ground ahead of time in faith. And... Today, I think it's really a message that is uh, encouraging and sobering, though, because I've been saying this for a while, since 2015, we have seen clear evidence from Yahweh's Holy Spirit that He is pouring out His Spirit, and every year seems to get more intense, and I've even went through in sermons a whole timeline of the different signs that Yahweh has shown, you know, the different uh, Revelation 12 sign in the heaven, and the uh, the blood moons that came, the treatise of blood moons, and all the different things that have happened in one after another after another. And with those signs, Yahweh has also been pouring out His Spirit. And we've been seeing other things. We've been seeing miracles. People that are blind getting their eyesight back. People that are deaf getting their hearing back. You know, amazing healings that people have, have, have gotten that we've seen. So Yahweh is showing all these signs and showing the signs that the latter rain is here. He is bringing that. And every year it's getting more intense. And now it's Shavuot. So now it's another year for us to get this. And some haven't seen any of it. Some are not growing. They're not bearing fruit. They're, uh, as these things are going on now with COVID-19 and all these other things that are happening, they're, they're in fear. And it's really a time uh, that we better think because we're hitting that dividing line where there's going to, you know, you hit that point of no return where the Philadelphians, you know, like it says, those who are, uh, sinning in Revelation will continue to be evil, and those that are continuing to do righteous will continue to do righteous. So like I say, this is a really important message to both the Philadelphian and to the Laodicean, to uh, encourage the Philadelphian to continue on this walk and embrace what he's doing, and to the Laodicean to wake him up. So are you preparing your fellow ground? Let's start in Hosea 10 and verse 12. Hosea 10 and verse 12 says, Sow to yourself in righteousness, reap as kindness, right? You reap what you sow. So if you sow righteousness, you reap kindness. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek Yahweh until he comes and rains righteousness on you. So what if 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 a field uh, uh, that you're you're literally seeding, right? If you have to, if that field is hard and you need to break up that hard land, you need to break up, you need to plow and break up that hard dirt to get the seed to go down so that it will germinate and it will bear fruit. Uh, spiritually, what would you think it is to break up your fallow ground in your spiritual life? It, it, it would basically be to circumcise your hearts. 
It would be a time where we really have to be looking in our hearts and circumcising our hearts and, and, and making that, that deep, because the heart is deep, going deep into our hearts and looking, are we sowing ourselves in righteousness so that we could reap kindness? Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek Yahweh until he comes and brings righteousness on you. I think we're going to see that uh, some in Western society are doing this and they don't even realize it. They don't even realize how they're not putting faith in Yahweh and they're putting too much faith in the system. Zechariah 10 and verse 1. Zechariah 10 and verse 1 says, As rain from Yahweh in the time of the latter rain, right? And here we are, we're in the time of the latter rain. Are you praying for that? You know, we just had seven sevens. We had seven complete uh, uh, Sabbaths, weeks, seven uh, cycles of Sabbaths, counting to Shavuot. And many people have been in lockdown. Many people haven't been able to leave their homes, you know, or their cities. Have you been praying to Yahweh to bring the latter rain? Have you been praying? Have you been counting every day, maybe even on a calendar, marking it off 49, 48, 47, counting all seven weeks? And are you praying and asking Yahweh in your prayers every day, Father, please bring to me your latter rain. Ask rain from Yahweh in the time of the latter rain. Yahweh shall send thunderbolts. So Yahweh does everything in a big way. It's not just sprinkles that are coming, but it's thunderbolts. And he gives them showers of rain, grass to each man in the field. Drop down to, to verse 6. And I will make stronger the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. So this is what's happening in the end time, right? The, the uh, reunification of Judah and Ephraim, right? And I will return to save them, for I will pity on them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am Yahweh your Elohim, and I will answer you. So we know Judah is being punished for the heinous crimes and sins that are going on there, but Yahweh hasn't forsaken them. And the same with Ephraim, Ephraim and the nations. Now we're seeing this. Where is these things happening? Where have been the financial troubles of recently? Where is COVID-19 in these plagues? They're coming in the Israelite nations primarily, right? And they're getting punished. Both Joseph, or Ephraim, and Judah, but Yahweh hasn't forsaken them. Right? So, and in the end time, when Yeshua returns, this is what he's coming to do. And their sons shall be glad, and their hearts shall rejoice in Yahweh. <clears throat> I will whistle for them and gather them, and I have redeemed them, and they shall be many as they were many. And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their sons in return. And since 2014 and 2015, the congregation of Yahweh, our congregation has been growing in leaps and bounds. I mean, it is amazing uh, how many tens of thousands of brethren have come to faith all over the world, like it's saying here, as Yahweh is calling his end time remnant. But we have to ask for the latter rain. We have to ask for the latter rain. Yahweh is calling his remnant as the harvest is near, but we must prepare in faith to bear fruit. Because again, if you don't prepare your fallow ground, you're not going to bear fruit. Jeremiah 4 and verse 2 and 3. Jeremiah 4 and verse 2 and 3 says, And you will hear as Yahweh lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, even the nation shall bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory, just like we're saying. In verse 3 of Jeremiah 4, For so says Yahweh to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and do not sow to the thorns. Break up your fallow ground and to, do not sow to the thorns. So are you sowing on stony ground and thorny ground? Because this is the whole point. Breaking up your fallow ground means you have to prepare your ground if you want to get harvest. And I'll tell you something, uh, because I've, I've been a gardener. For much of my life, I worked in, in landscaping for more than 15 years. And uh, one thing you know when you're planting is, if you're going to a place, and I went to places where they wanted me to plant a whole new backyard of grass, and the soil back there was totally sandy, I would have to bring in trucks and trucks and trucks of new soil before I would plant the grass, because if I planted the grass in bad soil, 
the seed, it would do absolutely nothing, or would start to come up, and then the sun would burst it because it's sandy soil and it can't take root. So you really, you have to make sure that your ground is not fallow or you're never going to bear fruit. You could bring the best seed in the world, but if you haven't broken your fallow ground, that seed is going to be worthless. So let's look at an example and see this from Matthew 13, verse 3 and 9. Matthew 13, verse 3 and 9. Says, and he spoke to them many things in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And in his sowing, some fell by the roadside, and birds came and ate them. Right? Why? Because the ground was not broken up. The seed was just laying there. And other fell on stony places where it did not have much earth. Right? It, it couldn't take deep root. And that's what happens. I tell the people sometimes. When people, I would plant a, a, a brand new uh, seed of grass, and then all of a sudden they'd say it's, it's, it's burned out. And I'd say, are you watering? Because number one, most people would not water their grass in the summer, and the heat of it is burning out. And they said, no, 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 I'm watering it. I'm watering it at least once or twice a week. And I'll say, well, when do you water? And they'll say, well, I water about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. How long do you water for? Oh, at least 10 minutes. And I say, you just burned out your own field. Because number one, you're watering at the heat of the day. So what happens? While that plant is so hot, those roots are coming up to try to get water. And when you water for 10 minutes, you're pulling the roots to the top. And then that's it. Now the roots are higher. The sun is coming and it's torching it up. That's the worst thing to do. What you want to do is you want to water in the cool of the day. You want to water early in the morning or you want to water late in the day as the sun is going down. And you don't water for 10 minutes. You want to water for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. You want to give it a good watering so that water is going all the way down deep in the roots. And that's what we're seeing here. That if it's stony ground, there's no deep root. If it's thorny ground, forget about it. You know, that's just nothing can come from there. And it says, verse 6, look, uh, verse 5 again, Another fell in stony places where it did not have much earth, and immediately sprang up because it had no depth of earth. And the sun rising, it was scorched because of having no root. It was dried up, just like I just said. I've seen this firsthand. And other fell on thorn bushes, and the thorn bushes grew up and choked them. And other fell on good ground and yearly yielded fruit, and did one a hundredfold, one sixty, one thirty. The one having ears to hear, let him hear. Right? So... We're praying to Yahweh, give us ears to hear. So what is he talking about? He gives us the meaning. Go down to verse 18. But you hear the parable of the seed, right? Everyone hearing the word of the kingdom and not understanding, then the evil one comes and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is that which was sown on the wayside. So very, very clearly, and it tells us in Luke also, that the seed is the word of Yahweh. The seed is the word of Yahweh. That's what we're planting. We're planting into ourself and other people. And that sown on the stony places is this, the one hearing the word and immediately receiving with joy, but he has no root in him, but is temporal. And when trouble or persecution comes, he is quickly offended because of the word. And I've seen this many, many times over the years. Like I said, I'm 36 years in this faith, and I see this. Somebody comes to faith, they're a nice person, and they're zealous, and they're excited, and they meet the brethren, you know, whether it's in a meeting we have somewhere, at the feast, and then all of a sudden, they go back, you never hear from the person again. And six months later, a year later, people will say, what happened to so-and-so? Have you heard from so-and-so? And they'll be all sad, thinking it was something they said, or something that happened. And it's like, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was a nice person who Yahweh opened their mind to the truth, and they started coming to the truth. But then what happened? It, 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 it was on stony ground. It had no depth. So the first thing that happened... Their husband or their wife started giving them a hard time about it. Their friends gave them a hard time about Christmas. Their job would not let them off for Sabbath. The first part of trouble that came up, they ran in the other direction. Because there was no, there was no depth to their calling. And verse 22, And that sown on the thorn bushes is the one hearing the word and the cares of this world. Well, this is most of what the Laodiceans. The cares of the world, the deceit of riches, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But that sown on the good ground is this one hearing the word and understanding it, who indeed bears fruit and yields fruit, one truly a hundredfold, one sixty and one thirty. So 
I think it's a pretty simple par parable to understand, right? That you have to break up your fallow ground because if you don't break it up and, and it's not deep enough, if it's on stony ground, then as trouble comes, and we're living in a tough time, I mean, even for people in the world, we've never seen anything like this before. Besides, I mean, in the last few years, we're talking about earthquakes and we're talking about hurricanes and, and, and famines and all these things that have been happening in the world and heavenly signs. But that's nothing now, as we're talking about worldwide pandemics. And people don't know what's going on. And if you are on stony ground, if you don't have depthness to your calling, you'll never make it. You will never, ever make it because, like I said, you'll run back to where you think there's safety in the government, in a vaccine, in, you know, government programs, whatever it is, you're going to run back to something, a job, whatever you think it is. So we have to make sure we're not on stony ground. That's not plowed enough. It's, it's the fallow ground hasn't been ready or thorny grounds, which is the cares of the world. The stony ground had no depth of calling, right? So this is what happened. The person started coming to the truth. They saw it was true because they were a decent, good person, but there was no depth there. There was no depth. They didn't, they didn't allow that to grow in their life. It was unplowed. There was no faith in action to follow through. And that's the brethren sometimes. So they're believing in the Sabbath. They're believing in the holy day. You know, they're, they're, they're meeting on the holy days or believing in the holy days, right? They're believing in maybe they're keeping tassels or they're believing in not doing this or doing that. But there's no faith in action, right? When push comes to shove, when something comes up, when the rubber hits the road, when somebody comes up and challenges them on something, right? That they had a good friend their whole life and now Christmas comes and they're not going to give that friend a Christmas gift because they don't believe in it. And now there's pushback. So they quietly do it another way. They take the friend out for dinner for Christmas or they do something. There's compromise. There's compromise because that's what it is. Because there's no faith in action. If you want depth to your calling, right? If you want to be on that good ground, you don't want to be on stony ground and you don't want to be on thorns and thistles, cares of the world, right? Then you, you have to have depth in your calling, which means there can't be compromise. There has to be faith in action. They must plow deeper. You have to plow deeper. What does that mean in your spiritual life? You have to study more. You have to pray more. You have to fast more. You have to meditate more. You have to put this into practice. It's not like, okay, here's a sermon for an hour. I listen, and now I put this away till next Sabbath. It's got to be faith in action. There's got to be faith in action. So it's got to be deeper, more study, more prayer, and stepping out in faith. When a situation comes up, don't take the easy road. No compromise, no retreat. Stand your ground, right? And know what's true. When you look at the, and, and read a book, there, there's books like uh, uh, The Martyr's Mirror and Fox's Book of Martyrs and all these books that show our forefathers, the people that went before us that believed the same way. And what these people did, how they stood in faith, they would not compromise whatsoever for their faith, even if it meant death. And I even think just recently, I, I, I look at what happened with the Amish back in the 1970s, where uh, things were so bad they didn't want their kids in public school anymore. And they took their kids out and they started homeschooling their children, right? And then all of a sudden the government came and they made an investigation and they said, I'm sorry, you can't do this. It's, it's illegal, you, you have to put your children in public school. So what would you have done in that case? You know, you tried your best, you know, you, 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 you non-violent uh, resistance and all this stuff. You tried your best and it didn't work. So I guess we got to put them in school. What can we do? Well, the Amish didn't do that. They didn't do that. You know what they did? The government came and took those fathers out of the house and put the Amish fathers in prison. And they were willing to go to prison and they were willing to pay any price they had to. But their kids weren't going to school. They were not going to compromise. And in the end, they changed the law. Now they allow the Amish people to, uh, to, to do their own homeschooling, you know. But we have to think about that. It's not a matter of only doing the right thing when it's convenient. It's a matter of like our forefathers, you know. When they came to the Waldenses and they said, all you have to do is baptize your babies and we'll let you go. And what would you have thought? Would you have thought, you know what, it doesn't mean nothing anyway. 
It's, it's like I give them a bath every day. I put them under water. Okay, let them sprinkle water, and then we'll be safe, and we could, we could worship the way we want, worship on Sabbath. They didn't think that way. And you know what? They came, and they killed those people. They killed those people, and they killed those babies, and they had those people come from the mountains with the babies hanging around their neck, but they were willing to die for what they believed. They were not going to compromise. And you need depth of faith to be able to do that. And that's why I say, you'll never die for, 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 for a doubt. And if you have a doubt in your life, if there's a doubt in doctrine, a doubt in whatever, you better get that doubt out because you will never die for a doubt. But you have to make sure that there's depth to your calling. You have to step out of faith. You have to allow Yahweh to water your faith for it to grow. And it's got to be deep. Now, thorny ground. People will trust too much in the system of Satan, right? These are the thorns and thistles, just like it was said in the book of Genesis to Adam. This would be his punishment through thorns and thistles. You would bear fruit. Uh, bear fruit. Human government is made by Satan. It's the time to step out in faith and separate from that system. We must believe and trust in the promises of Yahweh, right? Genesis 12, 1. Remember Abraham. Abraham, get up and walk. Abraham got up and walked. Abraham obeyed because his ground was not fallow. You know, because it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen like a snap that all of a sudden, you know, he has no faith in this one thing. No, for him to make that move, that means through his life, he was following Yahweh, everything he said. And that's the point of it, right? When you plant those seeds, right? How long does it take to come up? We planted tomato uh, plants now. And it doesn't come up overnight. It doesn't come up in a week. It doesn't come up in a month. It'll take several months, about three months, till you start getting that fruit. And within those three months, you've got to make sure that those roots can go deep enough. You have to make sure that there's water to that plant. You have to make sure you fertilize it. You have to make sure there's sunlight. There's a lot involved in getting fruit, right? There's a lot involved in it. So the people that are trusting too much in the system, Abraham believed because his ground was not fallow. But he prepared so he could move ahead in faith. We must plow. We must prepare the field before the seeds can be planted and fruit can come. And what I see is a lot of times I see people making excuses on why they're not preparing the ground. Forget planting. Forget bearing fruit. You have to prepare. If you don't prepare, it's never going to happen. If you believe that Yahweh's latter rain will come, then you must prepare your field. It's that simple. If you believe that Yahweh's latter rain will come, you must prepare your field. If not, what's going to happen? What's happening now? The latter rain is here, but you've got nothing planted. You know, or your ground is still fallow. Matthew 10 and verse 32. And why is this? Why is sometimes people's ground fallow? Matthew 10 and verse 32. Then everyone who shall confess me before men, I will confess him before my Father in heaven. Right? Think about that one for a minute. Do not think I came to bring calm on the earth. I did not come to bring calm, but a sword. You know, that's what people say. Jesus is only love. He's only love. They're not reading this. These are his words. He didn't come to bring calm. He didn't come to make your life easier with your workers, with your family, with your friends. He came to test you. I say it all the time. Life is a test, and that's all that matters. Are you passing that test? And when he brings that test to you, you better stand your ground. It doesn't matter who it's with. Because if you deny him, he'll deny you. Do not think I came to bring calm on the earth. I did not come to bring calm, but a sword. I came to divide a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a bride against her mother-in-law. And the adversaries of a man shall be those of his own house, unfortunately. And as we go more in the end, worse. Because it says people will be giving you wind. You know, don't expect your unconverted relatives to protect you in the end time. They'll be the ones who are turning you in. And the adversaries of a man shall be those of his own house. The one loving father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one loving son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his staff and follow after me is not worthy of me. The one finding his life shall lose it. And the one losing his life on account of me will find it. And these are the people in the thorny ground. They don't want to lose their life. Their life is entangled with all the cares of the world, with all these thorns and thistles, and it's choking their spiritual life. And it, it really is. It's time to come out of the system. And, you know, praise Yahweh with this uh, virus now. One of the blessings of it is that people are being forced to work from home. 
So now, I've been saying it for years, have family businesses. I'm not saying not to work. Work from your house, work in communities. What are our communities doing? They're doing their own food planning and even businesses in the community. You know, just like the kibbutzes in Israel. Furniture factories, you know, uh, making fruits, doing all this different stuff. So this is now, it's easy to do this. It's easy because it's going to become normal because of what's going on. So, but we need to be doing it. You need, if you believe that Yahweh's latter rain is coming, you've got to prepare your field. Is your ground fallow because you're trusting in self and not in Yahweh? What are you putting before the kingdom of Yahweh in your life? How many hours a day are you plowing for Yahweh's field and Yahweh's garden? And how many for yourself? And that's the, I say this at the school every single year. That's the simplest way. Make a list, sit down, make a list of what you do from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, right? And then figure out how much of that day is toward planting and fertilizing and watering for the kingdom of Yahweh and how much for yourself. And you know what? You reap what you sow. So it's so simple, you know? So you could deny it to yourself, but you can't deny it to Yahweh. So just simply do that. Take yourself 10 minutes, go privately somewhere and make a list. 7 o'clock, wake up. 7.15, you know, eat breakfast. 7.30, do this. Write what you do from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed and see how much time is toward Yahweh and how much time is toward yourself. John 15, John 15 and verse 1. Because as we're getting into this latter rain being poured out, this is, the, this is harvest time, right? This is harvest time. And I know some people are behind that they still have fallow ground. Some haven't planted. Some, but there's still time left. Because in Yahweh's harvest, things can happen very, very quickly. But you've got to break your fallow ground. That's the first thing to do. You have to get deepness in your calling. And you have to get deepness in your faith. John 15. I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. This is Yeshua speaking. Every branch in me not bearing fruit, he takes away. And everyone bearing fruit, he prunes so that may bear more fruit, right? The baptism of fire. Everyone, so don't think when you're going through the baptism of fire that you're being punished. You're not being punished. You're, when you're bearing fruit, Yahweh will prune it so you'll bear more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. As the branch is not able to bear fruit of itself unless it remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, this man will produce plentiful fruit, because without me you are not able to do anything. Unless one remains in me, he is cast out as the branch and is dried up, and they gather and throw them into a fire and they're burned, right? This is what I was saying yesterday. You have to stay close to the trunk of the tree. The Laodicean that is out there by himself, he thinks he's rich and increased with goods in need of nothing, he's being burned because he's not staying close to the trunk of the tree. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, whatever you desire you will ask and it will happen to you. In this my Father is glorified that you should bear much fruit and you will be disciples of me, right? It is a, a requirement of being a disciple is to bear fruit. And that's what we said, some 100-fold, some 60-fold, some 30-fold. But everyone in the kingdom is bearing some type of fruit. And that's what Shavuot is about. Shavuot is not only about the giving of the Holy Spirit, but it's the giving of the Holy Spirit by the fruit you've given. Because if you look at the parable of the talents, and I read it yesterday in the sermon, the one who had the one talent, I didn't go into that part, but the one who had the one talent and didn't bear any fruit with it, the little that he had was taken away, and that's indicative of the Holy Spirit. So if you're not bearing fruit, in, in, in the time now of the second Shavuot, where Yahweh's pouring out his spirit, if you're not growing in that spirit, the little you have will be taken away. It's that simple, that we have to bear fruit. We have to grow in the harvest, and we have to bear fruit. So I've said it many times, you could look at the Matthew 24 project we have online. It gives many, many, many different ideas from volunteering at hospitals, just visiting sick people, soup kitchens, anti-abortion clinics, handing out tracts in your towns and in your diners, uh, putting, putting tracts in places like Walmart, uh, bulletin boards and different things. Praying, praying for the work of Yahweh, praying for sick brethren, right? 
tithing, something as simple as tithing, which is a command. And how many people aren't doing that? They're not even doing the minimal that is a commandment of Yahweh. Helping the widows, helping the poor, you know, babysitting for a family, anything. Every single thing is bearing fruit when you're serving and helping another person, right? And this is what we're supposed to do. Like it says, if we're not bearing fruit, then our vine is withering away and it will be cast into the fire. Galatians 5 and verse 22. Galatians 5 and verse 22. The fruits of the Spirit, right? Galatians 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, against such things there is no instruction. But the ones belonging to Messiah, the uh, crucify the flesh with its passions and lust. Let us therefore live by the Spirit and surrender to the Spirit. So I've said this before, that if you want the gifts of the Spirit, and we're talking about gifts of healing, gifts of language, gifts of uh, word of wisdom, right? Uh, all the different the gifts that we see of the Holy Spirit that are there, you have to have the fruit of the Spirit because the gift is just an extension of your fruit. So how on earth do you think Yahweh would give you all of these gifts, gifts of teaching, you know, gifts of discernment? Why would he give you all these gifts if you have no fruit? The, 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 the fruit is the end result. Like it's right, it starts at the seed. And then you have to water it and you have to nurture it. And you have to see a little greenery come up. And then you get the little bit of fruit that's coming and you soft to nurture it and water it. And then after whatever time, it becomes a piece of fruit. And that's the gift. The fullness of the fruit is the gift. So if you have no fruit, you have no gift. And that's the key. You should be studying. Every single brother and sister should be studying these nine fruits of the Spirit and understanding how to grow in them. And then the gifts of the Spirit will come automatically. The gift is an extension of this fruit. And without any fruit, like I said, you're cast away. So you must have the fruits before the gift. The gift is the outward extension of the fruit. The gifts are used, gifts are used to harvest the fruit, right? So that's what the gift is for. The gift is used to harvest the fruit. It's like you need a truck when you're harvesting. If you're picking all this fruit, if you have hundreds of of thousands of pieces of fruit out in a field somewhere and you pick it how are you going to get it out of there you need big trucks to take it away and that's what happens the gift is like the truck it's the it's 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 the avenue to move the fruit and make it productive but you have to break up your fallow ground you have to break up your hard unplowed ground you have to circumcise your heart you have to circumcise your heart and that's what comes first. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Galatians 6 and verse 7. It says, Do not be deceived. Elohim is not mocked. Whatever a man may sow, he will also reap. Right? So it's that simple. If I'm out there putting 50 tomato plants in, when it comes time to harvest, I'm not going to be harvesting cucumbers. <laughs> you reap what you sow. So if you're not sowing... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Then you're not going to reap the gifts of the Spirit. What you sow is what you reap. So you have to think about this, you know. It's hard, but each of us, you've got to go in your prayer closet and pray to Yahweh. And that's why I've been saying for more than a year now, ask Yahweh for what you might even be doing that's a sin that you don't even know about. Because the lay of the same Spirit is in everybody to a certain degree. And we have to get rid of it. So we will reap what we sow. Is our ground ready or is it fallow? Are you preparing the ground? Because you know what? It takes a lot of faith to prepare the ground. Because when you do all the, 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 the preparing, and I'm going to read the, the psalm later, Psalm 126. You know, you sow in sorrow, but you reap in joy. Why is that? Because when you're sowing, you have no idea what's going to happen. You know, and uh, sometimes our family will watch Little House on the Prairie. I know some of the brethren like that. And you see in some of the episodes that, uh, you know, you see the father there and he's by himself. And this is in the 1800s, right? And he's just out there with his plow and, 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 and his, uh, his uh, 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 cow. 
And he's taking months and he's plowing and seeding and doing everything. And then as it's coming up, all of a sudden a storm comes and wipes away everything. All that hard work for three months, four months, sometimes five months is gone with one hailstorm, right? And that's why you, 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 you sow in sorrow, but you reap in joy. Because you don't know what's coming at the end. And that's the problem. If you don't have faith, that's the reason why your ground is fallow. Because you're not believing it's going to come. You've got to believe in faith that that latter rain is going to come and you have to prepare now without seeing anything. Think about uh, uh, Noah. Noah's out there not for a day or a month or one season. He's out there for a hundred years building an ark where you never had one drop of rain come. It never rained in the world. Talk about the faith that that man had. But certainly his ground was not fallow. His ground was plowed. It was deep. And we need that deep faith if we're going to bear fruit. Because before you can bear fruit, you have to have it ready. You have to have the ground ready. Is your ground ready or is it fallow? And what seeds are you planting? Jeremiah 4 and verse 3. Let's go back to Jeremiah 4 again. For so says Yahweh to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and do not sow to the thorns, right? Break up your fallow ground. You've got to prepare if you're going to receive. Drop down to verse 5. Declare in Judah and make it heard in Jerusalem and say, blow the ram's horn in the city. Cry the end, right? The end, and here we are. And say, assemble yourself and go to the cities of defense. Go to the cities of refuge. Lift up a banner toward Zion. Flee for safety and do not wait. For I will bring evil from the north in a great ruin. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations has set out. He has left his place to make your land a waste. Your cities will fall into ruins without one living in them. And it's coming. It's coming. We see it already. We see now with this lockdown. We see with the, with the, the plague, the COVID-19 plague. And people are not breaking their fallow ground. Are people preparing, like it says, flee for safety and do not wait. Do not wait. And if you can't flee yet, are you preparing? You know, you can't just use an excuse. You can't use an excuse as a crutch. You know, there could be a brother or sister out there that maybe is crippled. And that's the crutch you're going to use. Well, I would if I wasn't crippled. And I do this if I wasn't crippled. Well, you know what? Crippled person can pray just as good as somebody who's not crippled. Crippled person can encourage somebody even better than somebody who's not crippled. Because when you're crippled and you're giving all this encouragement, people think, wow, look what this person's doing. He's crippled. And look how zealous and encouraging he is. So there's no reason not to be breaking our fellow ground. Are you preparing for a city of refuge? That's where Yahweh's bringing his people. And even if you're not there yet, are you preparing at least? Do you have a plan of action? Are you making some kind of plan or just an excuse? If not, then your ground is still fallow. If you really believe the rain will come, then you have to prepare your fallow ground. And if not, then you're not believing the rain is coming. You're kidding yourself. You're the layout of saying you think you're rich and increased with goods in need of nothing, and you're poor, you're blind, you're miserable, and you're naked. For many, pride, <coughs> self-righteousness, and fear has stopped them. Pride, self-righteousness, and fear has stopped them. Jacob 1, in verse 22. Jacob 1 in verse 22. It says, Having purified your souls in obedience to the truth through the Spirit to sincere brotherly love. Oh, I'm in Peter. Sorry about that. Jacob 1 in verse 22. It says, But become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Right? Become doers doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, this one is like a man studying his natural face in a mirror. For he studied himself and has gone away and immediately he forgot how he looked. But the one looking into the perfect law of liberty and continuing in it, this one not having become a hearer of the word, which can be forgotten, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in his labor. Very clear, right? You reap what you sow. And we can't just be hearers of the words. We have to be doers of the word. That's what faith is. 
Faith without action is dead. You know, there's a story about a great drought that came. And it was a drought for a long, long time. And uh, there was no harvest there. And there were two men that prayed for rain. One man prepared his field and the other one didn't. Who do you think got the rain when it came? Right? Two men prayed, one prepared the field, one didn't. In Kenya, due to the locust plague that was there, do you know that many people, not brethren, but many people in Kenya decided not to even plant their fields? They saw the locust, they said, the locust is eating everything, right? We sow in sorrow, we reap in joy. Why am I going to plant and do all this hard work when these locusts are going to come and eat everything? Two men were praying for rain. One prepared his field, one didn't. Who got the rain when it came? In Kenya, half the people didn't plant because they knew the locusts would eat. But you know who planted? The congregation of Yahweh, Jerusalem, planted. They're the ones that planted in faith. Their ground was not fallow. They planted in faith. And like I said, a canopy of these things. The locusts came, but it didn't eat their field. It didn't eat their field. Amazingly, the brethren lost nothing because their ground was not fallow. They circumcised their hearts. Jacob 2 and verse 17. Back to the book of Jacob, verse 17. He says, So also faith, if it does not have deeds, is dead to itself. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith apart from your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Drop down to verse 26. For as the body is dead apart from the spirit, so also faith without deeds is dead. Faith without deeds is dead. If you're not preparing your field, you simply don't believe it's going to rain. You have to plow your fallow ground. You have to trust in Yahweh that he can do it. Prepare in faith, believing that Yahweh will be the answer. So, like I said, I think it's not only a great story for our brethren in Kenya. It's not only great encouragement for our brethren there, you know, and it's pretty, we, we, like I said, we planted for all the country. It wasn't just one person's field that was there. We invested time and money and energy and, and, and so that all the brethren there can benefit from the harvest. But that is an example to every single one of us as a believer today, that you have to make sure you're not fallow ground. You have to make sure you're not making excuses because of the circumstances that are around you. And they, like I said, with the crippled person, there could be real circumstances. There could be real reasons. But still, man, Yahweh doesn't need any crutches. Yahweh doesn't need a crutch. And that's why when Yeshua came, he didn't feel sorry for the crippled person. He healed the crippled person. And he healed the blind person. And today in our congregation, we're doing the same thing. You know, we're doing the same thing. Healing people, I, I, I was just saying recently, when I was in Ethiopia, I think it was around uh, 50 to 75 people in the end that wound up being healed in just one, one prayer session. And it's not me. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with Yahweh because Yahweh is pouring out his latter rain. But if your ground is fallow, you're not going to receive it. You have to break up that ground. You have to circumcise your heart. You have to not have stony ground. You have to have depthness of heart. And it all comes by your faith. And faith does come by hearing and hearing the word of Yahweh. And the more faith is an action. Faith is not a word. Faith is not a belief. Faith is an action. You use your faith and your faith is going to grow. You have to believe in Yahweh. No matter what the circumstances, you don't believe you, you will be healed. You believe you can be healed. And then it's up to Yahweh. That's what faith is. Faith is trusting Yahweh in any circumstance and whatever the outcome, you're going to be good with it, right? The Amish that had faith when they went to prison because they weren't going to send their children to school. They didn't have faith that everything was going to be okay and they wouldn't go to prison. That's not faith. Faith is not dictating to Yahweh your outcome. Faith is that you've prepared whatever the outcome is, that that faith is going to get you through it. And that's the point we're at now. Because we're living in a time now where we're getting ready for a massacre. We're getting ready for a slaughter, for a great martyrism of our people. 
And it's going to happen because Yahweh's word says it. So it's not a matter of always everything turning out the way I thought. It's a matter of trusting Yahweh completely for absolutely everything, right? Let's go back to Hosea, Hosea 6, Hosea 6. He says, come and let us return to Yahweh, for he is torn and he will heal us. He has struck us and he will bind us up. After two days, he will bring us to life. In the third day, he will raise us up, right? Yeshua was raised on the third day and also he came in the fourth millennium. After two more days, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Two more millenniums after the six thousand year, then he will raise us up and we, will, we shall live before him. Then we shall know we who follow on to know Yahweh and his going forth is established as the dawn and he will come to us as the rain, as the latter and former rain to the earth, right? He's coming as the latter rain and we need this latter rain to get through the end time. Yahweh's doing it. He's giving us the latter rain for his work to continue and he's given us that latter rain because we need it to build faith. We need that spirit to build our faith. Passover was seven weeks ago, right? And I was saying this that Yahweh showed me this year that the whole count to Passover, you know, it's like our whole life cycle as a believer. We get baptized. Uh, Passover is about baptism. And then we have seven cycles of seven. They're complete life. It's like the rest of our life we live. And then Shavuot is like the resurrection. It's like, you know, being uh, uh, the outpouring of a spirit or being turned into a spirit being. And it's harvest time. Shavuot is harvest time. The latter rain has come like I said, since around 2015. But the question is, are you getting it? Are you getting it? And the first thing is we have to break our fellow ground. Uh, just to, I, I went over this before, but just to mention about the growing season in Israel. Because the growing season in Israel is very interesting. It's, it's a semi-arid uh, climate there, you know, meaning semi-desert climate. And they go seven, eight months without any rain. Period. Not a drop of rain on a normal year. So, the agricultural year actually starts after Sukkot. Sukkot is the head of the year where everybody comes and they bring all their harvest fruit. You have this great celebration. And then in October, you have to break your fallow ground. In October, you have to uh, break your ground. You have, to, you have to plant. And then you have to pray for the early rain. Because if you do all that work and you do all that planting and you have no rain in November, early December, then nothing's going to happen. What's going to happen? The birds are going to eat it. The wind is going to blow it away. Uh, you, but you, you, nothing will happen. If you get the early rain, then it comes up like little grass. And that's why if you come to Israel on a blessed year, uh, by mid-December to late December, the whole country will be green. I say it looks like Ireland, these little rolling hills. But that's the way it happens. Then the rain always comes in January and February, less you know, during Eliyahu's drought or a real bad drought where there's no winter rain and it has happened. But most of the time, 90% of the time or more, January, February, late December, the rain will come. But then what you have is you have your, your, your plant there. But if you don't pray and you don't get the latter rain in March, you know, late February and in March, sometimes even going into early April, your plant will never come to fruition. And that's our life as a believer, right? We need that, that, that early rain. So when we're baptized, we need to, the early rain. We need that to get that jump start as a new baptized person and going out and building our faith. And then as a believer during your life, right, you kind of hit like uh, an area where you're, 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 you're going. You know the doctrines. You're in the congregation. Everything's going. That's like the rain. That's like the January, February rain. But now we're in the end time. And unless you get that letter rain, you will never mature as a believer. And that's why I say, it's like the seven weeks of Shavuot is like our whole life as a believer. And you can't just get comfortable with, well, you know the Sabbath and you, know, and you keep Shabbat and you're not breaking it. And you're pretty much keeping the commandments okay. But you get in this rut where you're not really bearing fruit and you're not really growing. Right? And that's why you need the letter rain. Because you have to mature. It's not enough just to know the commandments. Even if you're doing them pretty good, you have to mature as a believer and you have to bear fruit. So that's why the latter rain is so important because without the latter rain, it will not bring the body of Messiah to fruition or to completion. Acts 2 and verse 1, 
Let's look at the first Shavuot, Acts 2 and verse 1. He says, and in the fulfilling of the day of Shabbat, they were all with one mind in the same place. And suddenly a sound came out of the heaven as a groaning spirit along a violent wind. And it was filled the entire house where they were sitting. And tongues as a, as a fire appeared to them being distributed and it sat on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave ability for them to speak. And Jews were living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation of those under the heaven. And when the sound occurred, all the people gathered and were perplexed because they were hearing each man among them who were speaking in their own language. And all were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, we can't grasp this. Are not all these Galileans? Are not, are not all these those speaking Galileans? How do we hear in our own language, each one in our own language in which we were born? Drop down to verse 14. But standing up the eleven. With the eleven, Peter lifted his voice and spoke to them, Men, Jews, and all those living in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. For these are not drunk as you imagine, for it is the third hour of the day. But this is that which was prophesied by Joel. And it will be in the last day, says Yahweh, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And we're actually having this. You know, in certain places, uh, People are having visions from Yahweh that are coming and, and that are coming to pass. And I will also pour out my spirit on my servants and my handmaids in those days, and they will prophesy. And I will give wonders in the heavens above and the miraculous signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness and the moon into blood, right? Conjunctions. Before the coming and great and glorious day of Yahweh. And it shall be that when everyone who shall call on the name of Yahweh will be saved. So, wow, right? This was the first rain, the early rain, and now we're in the latter rain. We're living in the time of the latter rain. Joel, Yoel 2 and verse 23. Yoel 2 and verse 23. But now, just like that happened there, we're seeing the same things. The same signs that Yahweh showed with the early rain, we're seeing with the latter rain. And it should excite us, and it should make us to be preparing our fallow ground and getting ready for the great work that we have ahead of us. Yoel 2 and verse 23 says, Then be glad, sons of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your Elohim. For he has given to you the early rain according to righteousness, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The early rain and the latter rain in the first month, right? Like I said, you need that early rain for it to take root, just like the early congregation needed the early rain for it to take root and go worldwide. But now we need the latter rain to bring the work of Yahweh to fruition, to bring it to completion. And the floor shall be full with grain and the wine vat shall overflow with wine and oil, right? The completeness of Yahweh's life cycle. And I will restore to you the years which the swarming locust has eaten, the locust larva, the stripping locust, the cutting locust, my great army which I sent to you. And you shall eat fully and be satisfied, and you will praise the name of Yahweh your Elohim, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall not be ashamed forever. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and I am Yahweh your Elohim, and there is no other. And my people shall not be ashamed forever. So, wow. Yahweh has been pouring out the latter rain since 2015. And you know what? I'm sure there's some that are listening that are a little bit sad because they, have, they haven't broke their fallow ground and they haven't been receiving that letter rain because of some of the things I'm mentioning here, because their faith isn't deep enough. But did you hear what I said? He said here that Yahweh will restore to you what has been missing. So if you've been out there, if you've realized over the last few months that you've had a Laodicean spirit, or whatever kind of spirit out there, and you haven't been fully embracing Yahweh's end time work, and you haven't fully been embracing your calling, and you haven't been bearing fruit the way you should, this should be exciting, because Yahweh's saying, turn now, turn now. This is a pivotal Shavuot. We are at a turning point here. And like I said, there's a wide road there that's very flat and very easy to go, and many will go. But turn now to the right, right? And go on that narrow, constricted road, and it's going to be uphill, and it's going to be tough. 
but the kingdom of Yahweh is at the top of that hill. And the other hill, it's going to lead you right over the cliff into the lake of fire. So there's, there's encouragement for those that haven't been doing it yet that Yahweh's saying he will restore what you've lost. So we're doing it. And like I said, for the brethren who for the last five years have been getting that outpouring and we're working and we see it, we, we don't want more. We don't want more of it. We don't want to say, well, you only work this much. No, we want everyone to get the same reward. The same as the people in the field. The ones that worked 11 hours and the ones that worked one hour got the same reward. And that's the way we are. The ones that are working only want all the brethren to come into this great outpouring of Yahweh's spirit in the end time. So there's no animosity there. There's no, oh, he just came now and he's going to get the same reward. No. Praise Yahweh that everyone will be rewarded in the end time. Since 2014, as a congregation, we've been preparing our fallow ground. We've been building communities. We've been building cities of refuge for the time coming just ahead. Some have lacked faith, and without realizing it, they still have fallow ground. If you believe the word of Yah, you must prepare your field, which is your life and faith, believing that the latter rain will come on you because the latter rain is here. Amos 4 in verse 7 and 8. Amos 4 in verse 7 and 8 says, And I have also withheld the rain from you when it was yet three months of the harvest, and I caused rain to fall on one city and caused it not to fall on another city. One piece was rained, and the piece where it did not rain was dried up. So, wow, <laughs> this is what happens in the end time, right? You can't get Yahweh's spirit from somebody else. Right? Yahweh had it rained on one city and not rained on another city. And this is the way it happens. The same way Yahweh has in, in Africa. The locusts are eating everything, but they're not eating where the brethren are. So you can't get it from someone else. The ten virgins, right? The ten virgins, when the time came and they realized, uh oh, we don't have the Holy Spirit, and they tried to ask the Philadelphians, give it to us, what they say? We can't give it to you. We can't give it to you. You can't give the Holy Spirit to somebody else. You have to work for it. You have to pray for it. You have to ask for it. And you're going to reap what you sow. So, in the end time now, you can't get it from somebody else. Yahweh is showing distinction between Egypt and Israel. The world and his covenant people, he's showing the difference, right? The locusts consume Africa. They pass by the people of Yahweh. Many didn't even plow their fallow ground. But we are prepared in faith. We've been preparing we've been plowing because we knew this faith was coming there's there's some people in africa that are thinking that i'm a prophet because the things i was saying are coming to pass i'm saying i'm not a prophet i just believe scripture i read the scripture and i believe it with all my heart and that's why i've been preparing because i believe in joseph's dream pharaoh's dream to joseph i believe in it and i know it so when i see this coming now i'm not surprised because i've been breaking up my fallow ground because I'm working on it. And now is the time where everybody needs to do it. We see the times we're living in. We see the kingdom of Yahweh coming closer. And we see there's evidence. There's miracles. There's no reason for someone not to believe that Yahweh is pouring out his spirit in the latter rain is here. We just need to follow through now. Psalm 126 and verse 3. Psalm 126 and verse 3. This is the psalm I was referring to before. Psalm 126 and verse 3. A song of ascents when... Uh, I'm going to start in verse 3 to 6. Yahweh did great things to work with us. We are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Yahweh, like the south streams. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. Surely he who walks and weeps, bearing a bag of seed, shall come again with joyful shouting. Bearing in the sheaves, right? And there's a song about that, right? Bringing in the sheaves. Because this is not talking about... It's, it's an analogy. Like I said, in the Garden of Eden, Yahweh didn't create the universe and the planets and all mankind for Adam to make tomatoes. You know, nothing wrong with tomatoes. But that's not why he did it. When he's talking about bearing fruit and multiply, he's talking about bringing human beings into Eden. And the same way here, when he's talking about uh, bringing in the sheaves, he's talking about bringing in the great harvest. But those who sow in tears will reap with joy. Because like I said, when you're out there and you're breaking up your fallow ground, it is hard work. It is hard work doing all that hard work. And you get nothing for it in the beginning. It takes months and months and months. 
of doing all that hard work, breaking the ground, putting in the seeds, and like I said, praying for the rain to come, and then fertilizing it and weeding it and all that stuff. But when Yahweh blesses you and the harvest comes and you're reaping it, that's why, like it says, they'll, they'll reap with joyful shouting. And that's why Sukkot is such a joyful feast because all those months of sowing in tears, you come to Sukkot with the blessing of what Yahweh blessed you with. And when you come to Sukkot with the wine and with the pomegranate and with the, the, all the harvest fruits and the dates and the olives, you know that Yahweh blessed your work there. So this is where we're at now, right? We sow in sorrow in this world as we go through the baptism of fire, but we will reap with joy in the kingdom. And you need faith to do this. You need faith to quit a $100,000 a year job knowing that in the kingdom you're going to be a king and a priest and, and your worth will be in the trillions. You need faith. And that's why I say the only way to get that faith is break your fallow ground. Because if you, if, you're, if you only are on stony ground, if there's no depth to your calling, you will never give up that $100,000 a year job for the Sabbath or anything else. And that's why people walk away, right? Like, like the rich man in, in, in Matthew 19, when Yeshua said, the one thing you lack, give everything you have to the poor and come follow me. And the man walked away because he had many riches. So that we have to, we have to deepen our calling. We have to deepen our faith. Psalm 125 one psalm over. Again, a song of a sense. They who trust in Yahweh will be like Mount Zion. It will not be shaken. It remains forever. And that's where Yeshua is coming back to. The mountains are all around Jerusalem as Yahweh is all around his people from this time and forevermore. Or we could say, the mountains are around. We sing this song all the time. Jerusalem as Yahweh is around his people. But it's so true. The mountains are around Jerusalem as Yahweh is around his people, right? Yahweh's spirit, his protection is in the camp. And that's why Yahweh is making. I wondered for years, I'm 36 years in the faith, I wonder, how on earth when the mark of the beast comes, you can't buy your cell, how will Yahweh get his people through? And when he started making these cities of refuge, when he started building these kibbutzes around, and like I said, the brethren wanted to do it. I never asked anybody or forced anybody, they wanted to do it. And I helped them along with it. I said, well, Yahweh, now I know. This is how you're going to do it. This is how you're going to do it. Because the same way you separated Egypt and Israel is the same way in the end time you'll separate your people. And that's why it's time to come out of the world. The Shabbat is a big dividing point in time and in the kingdom of Yahweh. Deuteronomy 11, 13 and 14. Deuteronomy 11, 13 and 14. And it shall be if listening... You will listen to my commands, which I command you today, to love Yahweh your Elohim, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, that I will give the rain of your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil, right? The grain is the staple food, and that's why I'm telling people, you have to store staple food. You have to store flour or, or rice, or some kind of staple food like that, right? And then the oil. You need the oil to cook, right? That's what the woman with, with Elisha and Elijah, right? That's what she needed. She needed oil. Because how can you make the bread without the oil? The oil is like the Holy Spirit. It's, and it's, it, it's also for healing when we see the healing, the olive oil. That's what we use for our anointing oil, right? And then the wine. The wine is just showing the completeness of Yahweh's blessing. And that's why at the wedding supper, there's wine there. And that's why Yeshua said, when he had the fruit of the vine, the wine on the last Passover, would he say, I will not drink this again with you until I drink it new in my Father's kingdom. At the wedding supper, there will be wine at the wedding supper. Because Yahweh's complete cycle of blessing will be there with his people. And all we have to do is ask. Because the latter rain is here, and Yahweh's pouring it out. Galatians 6, 8, 9. Galatians 6, 8, 9. We read this before, read it again. For the one sowing to his flesh will reap corruption of the flesh. But the one sowing to the Spirit will reap everlasting life from the Spirit. And let us not be weary now that we are working for good, for in the season of reaping, we will not faint. Right? So the ones who are doing this in faith, that are zealous in faith, and that's what it says to the Laodiceans, you've got to get zealous. You've got to get zealous. You can't be half-hearted. 
You can't be lukewarm. You can't be like, well, either way. No, you've got to be zealous. And if you are, at the end of the day, you will not be weary. For in the season of reaping, we will not faint, we will not be weary. We need to put on a spirit of zealousness. You will reap what you sow. You can't live a faithless life with no fruit and think you're going to be rewarded for it. Because Yahweh knows all the same way. You could be doing many things. I always say this. There's many a widow who pray three, four, five hours a day for the last 2,000 years that we have no idea what, who they are, what their names are. They've come and gone, but everything is recorded in heaven. And Yahweh knows, and they'll get their reward. So Yahweh is watching, good or bad. Yeshua is coming back to give each his reward according to his work, good or bad. So if we are working, it doesn't matter whether people see it or not. It's not a matter of being seen. It's a matter of doing it for Yahweh, right? Last scripture, Revelation 22. Revelation 22 and verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is the one keeping the words of the prophecy of this book. Drop down to verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of the book because the time is at hand, right? Here we are, we're living in this day. In verse 12, And behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to give each according to his work. Very, very clearly, we will reap what we sow. Are you exhibiting a Laodicean spirit or a Philadelphian spirit? Is your ground fallow, unprepared, with excuse after excuse? The reason why it's that way? Or is it plowed and seeded with all nine fruits of the Spirit, preparing our following by being sanctified from the world and leaving the old ways behind? Breaking bad relationships, breaking bad habits, taking control of our lives, and bearing fruit for the kingdom of Yahweh. And waiting and working in faith and humility for the great, greater harvest of the latter rain is still yet to come. So how exciting, right? Here it is, Shavuot 2.20, it's harvest time. And I have to say something. Uh, over the last couple months, it has been difficult for me because we're restricted now. For the last at least several years, I've been on a sense of urgency and making trips that I probably wouldn't have made before, traveling around the clock, helping our brethren, going out, doing Matthew 24, and now, to me, the most frustrating part of what's happening now is, with everything being in a lockdown, it's hard for us to go out and do that work. There's people needing baptisms. There's people in, 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 in camps that are waiting for baptisms. And it's like it's showing me, uh, oh, I wish, I wish we would have even done more. And it makes me think of Schindler's List, if anybody's ever seen that movie uh, amazing man, a Gentile man who saved many Jews' life during the Holocaust. And this guy was a multimillionaire. He had a factory making uh, armament for the war, for the Germans. And he had all these Jews that he brought in there and saved their lives to work in there. And he purposely made sure that none of the stuff would work. None of the guns and the bombs and that stuff. And you would think somebody who saved, they called them Schindler's Jews, because if it wasn't for him, those people would be dead. Several thousand people, and then their children and their children, right? You think of that. And when the time came, he wasn't there saying, Oh, I'm so happy with all I did. He looked at his watch and said, That could have been five more people. He looked at his car and said, That could have been ten more people. He realized in the end, with everything he did, it wasn't enough. And how many today have fallow ground? How many today are not even putting seeds down of faith for whatever reason. So, like I said, we are at a turning point here. And it's going to be tough from here on end as the congregation goes underground. That open door that we've had is really not open anymore. It's open in one way, but it's not open like it was before. And praise Yahweh, we did a great work. Many, many tens of thousands of people come to faith, but there's still work to do. And it's going to be harder from here. It's going to be harder because of these lockdowns, because of martial law, because of the mark of the beast coming. It's only going to get harder as we go along here. And that's why we need to be building the faith and we need to be breaking that ground. We don't want to be on stony ground. We don't want to be on thorny ground. We want to have depth of earth. And even though we sow in tears, 
We want to reap with joy at the kingdom of Yahweh. Yahweh bless. Hatsameh.